Bachata Poppy Wow It's Bachata Time Dame tu bachata, tigre The Bachata Poppy Wow podcast is brought to you by Sebastian Couture Sebastian Couture is for men who, regardless of the occasion Want to be dressed in the highest quality and impeccable fashion From blazers to shoes, belts to suits They got you covered from head to toe Another one of our sponsors is Fuego Are their dance shoes comfortable? Yes. Can you dance on any surface and spin like crazy? Yes. But what I love about my Fuego dance is that they are absolutely perfect no matter what you're wearing. You can wear them with suits, you can wear them casual, you can wear them on a block, you can wear them in the studio, you can wear them at the nightclub, you can wear them at a festival. It doesn't matter where you are, you can rock your Fuegos. Look good, feel good, Fuego. What's up, brother? How are you going? <laughs> How you doing? Good, good. Ah, so you just came from San Francisco. Yeah, from the Bachata Festival. San Francisco Bachata Festival, but you live in Sydney? Sydney, Australia. Sydney, yeah. Australia. Well, this is our first episode of uh, Bachata yeah. Popi Podcast. And for me, it's an absolute honor to have you because, um, you know, without you, a lot of this wouldn't have happened. And, you know, I think sometimes it's important for people to appreciate doors that needed to be open, risks that needed to be yeah. taken. And, you know, it's easy, oh, it would have happened anyway. Yeah, but it might have happened completely different. And um, thanks to you and your team and all the people, which we're going to find out, you know, all yeah. the stuff that you've done. But I wanted to start off by just giving you your flowers, thanking you, and, and really saying what an honor it is to be here Thank you. with you. How, how, so how long have you been in the, the dance? Okay. Been dancing for just over 20 years now. Okay. Um, which, that's why I'm 25. Okay. <laughs> Since five years old. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've been dancing about 20 years. Um, but I started with salsa first, because when I first started, especially in Australia, Bajata wasn't around. Got it. Um, and then about 2007, 2008, yeah, 2007, I uh, started with Bajata. I started learning the basics because uh, a guy from Chicago came over and his name is Juan Ruiz, oh, which you okay. know, and yeah. he walked into my studio. He was from Chicago? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. He was visiting or did he move? Um, he moved. He didn't know anybody. He walked into my studio. Um, I met him at reception, showed him the ropes, we became friends, and then um, he taught me my first basics. And I went to Italy for a tour because I was dancing salsa, had 10 cities to do. I remember I was at a club, it was called Pala Kavliki, and we were in the salsa room, and I went for a walk into the other room. It's like 3,000 people dancing. It was the bachata room. Oh, wait, did you say 3,000 people? Yeah, it was like 4,000 in salsa, maybe like 3,000, a little bit less in the bachata room, and it was packed. And that's where I fell in love with bachata. 3,000 people dancing bachata in Easy. Sydney? No, no, in Rome. Oh, in Rome. When I was doing right. the, you went to Italy. I went Got to it. Italy, doing a tour there. And that's when I really fell in love with Bachata. Now, this is a nightclub? What was this? It was a nightclub in Rome. Um, so, okay. Palais Cavliki is the, the biggest nightclub in Rome. And okay. I think it's closed now, if I'm not mistaken. But they also used to have the Rome Salsa Festival. There. Okay. Um, it was a shock for me to see so many people dancing Bachata, considering that there wasn't that much Bachata in Australia at the time. Gotcha. Now, was it a... So, obviously, we're at a nightclub. Were was the room a hundred percent bachata, or were they going back and forth? Like, was it a Latin night? And so no, hundred percent bachata. A hundred percent bachata. In yeah, Rome. and this was two thousand eight, as she said. Uh, okay. Yeah, probably because you know, I started dancing, so it would have been about two thousand and nine. Two thousand and nine. Yeah, two thousand nine, two thousand eight, something like that. Yeah. Wow, that I, I'm blown away. I didn't know that. that yeah, was, that's so cool, and. and What, like, when you looked at the people, how were they dancing? Like, what, what did the style look like? Very they... different to what it is now. Um, um, it was a lot more basic, a lot more traditional or moderna, which way you want to call it, um, in the sense, whereas, you know, you had traditional, very basic, and then you had turn patterns, which, you know, salsettos added the turn patterns. And so you could see the salsa influence. Okay. Because it was mainly close. And partner work. So they were already, you were already seeing people incorporating partner work at this Yeah, time. not body movement and stuff. So not this is the, the Zuki stuff, the sensual stuff. 
but term patterns and, and okay. management. That's interesting that you called it the Zuki stuff because I, I was going to ask you about yeah. the names, right? So yeah. I, when we teach, we tell people, look, we understand that it's sensual, but you guys call it sensual bachata. I prefer calling it Zuki bachata because we're oh, 100%. Those. Now, you know, what, what can you tell us about the names, where they came from, your experience, and yeah. why you call it Zook, or you know, what, when did different names come about? Because you, you use traditional, you use Moderna, and now you've used yeah. Zook Central. So, for me, when I started, it was very basic, very traditional. So, if you go back to 2007, 2008, I made a Bachata DVD, okay. instructional DVDs back then. I think the only one who had an, one out at that point was Tony Lara. Okay. Um, but because I saw his and I thought it was a good idea, um, we got our ones out. But our twist was that the first dance I learned before salsa and bachata was lambada. Okay. And lambada is the precursor to zouk. So if you look at my videos from way back, all the body rolls and the muñecas, I was adding it back then. And I have those on the DVDs. But at that point in time, we used to constantly be told, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. Really? Um, who, who was telling you that? Or anyone in Australia who was trying to do bachata. Okay. Or also at that time, I was going to the LA Congress. I was coming over to the US a lot. Bachata wasn't big at all at that point. This is the um, Albert, Albert Torres. Albert Torres, yeah. Um, but for me, the more we were told no, I was like, okay, I don't want to <laughs> <laughs> <Don't> do that. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I, I guess everything has its phase. And for me, you know, I owe your respect to sensual style. I, th I think it's great. And I try to keep up by learning as many styles of bachata and understanding why people do it. But my pref my preference of that kind of style, kind of, I moved on from that after my initial stage where I was adding the lambada, which is the precursor to Zook, those steps. And then when everybody started doing it yeah. through bachata sensual, which started in Spain with Corky and Judith, mm -hmm. um, then I moved away from it a little bit. Gotcha. Yeah. So. When you're in LA, yeah, uh, was there a bachata room? Or were, did they have, did they play bachata music? No, or was it just it was it, it was all fancy. Also? Okay, so you didn't yeah. get an opportunity to take any classes there or dance any bachata there. No, nope. go to LA. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, there, there wouldn't have been any bachata workshops at that point in time. Got it, got it. And when you were, so Juan was giving you the first bachata basics, yep. right? Um, was he? giving you any feedback were you guys collaborating together in any way and developing your own style like for the dvds was that something um, you just kind of did on your own no i mean because i was already traveling a lot for salsa mm -hmm. he showed me the basics and stuff and then i just started adding the elements that i knew yeah. being lambada and salsa okay um he was already doing turn patterns and stuff anyway um from from what he brought from Chicago and he he went more towards the spanish style of the cross step and what was called a Spanish style at that point. Got it. Um, by people like Inaki. Um, and then he kind of penned the name Bachata Moderna. Okay. And he used that as a, a, a means to get his name and his style. And so that's, he went that way and I, I stuck to my salsa, lambada kind of fusion with the bachata. Nice. Yeah. So I can't remember what year it was, but uh, we were at the Sexy Latin Fest. Yep. with Tony Lara, and I remember him assigning these names. Now, my understanding was that was the first time Corketh and Judith workshop was called Central, Central Bachata. And he was the one who just was like, okay, you guys are gonna be, uh, Alemana, you're urban, uh, Tigre, you're gonna do Dominican style or whatever. Yeah. Um, it, it, have you heard that? Can you confirm yeah, that? Yeah, 100%. Okay. From my understanding, yeah. um, also it was Tony Lara who penned the name perfect. Central Bachata for Co uh, Judith and Corky. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Now, so, you know, I at this time, Ataka La Alemana were kind of doing most of the traveling, so I was, yep. I was at home a lot in the U.S., and so I didn't really see some of the stuff happening at the yep. Congresses. Uh, so, I, you know, I would like to hear from you you know, any insight that you might add. So I've, I've heard that Carlos Espinosa, who had some, um, I guess, Brazilian Lambada or Zouk training, him and Sarah yep. were teaching some classes and um, Daniel and Desiree kind of learned 
some of that from there. I don't know if you can share any insight on that because you know everybody's going back and forth yeah. right now. You know who started the sensual and all this yeah. stuff. I don't know much about Carlos yeah. and Sarah doing that, and okay. whether Daniel and Desiree did classes with them. From my understanding, and I might be wrong, I thought Daniel and Desiree also learned from Judith and Cookie. Got it. Um, from my understanding, is the sensual movement in Spain stemmed from Judith and Cookie? Yes. Okay, I'm gonna I'm obviously hopefully have the opportunity to ask them specifically, because when you know, when I was seeing Corketh and Judith, they were doing more of the hip stuff, but I really wasn't seeing a lot of the Lambazook stuff yeah. until later on. Yeah. So I'm fascinated and curious as to how that that actually got in, but we'll hopefully yeah. get a chance to ask them directly one day. <laughs> so okay, you did a DVD. You're now traveling. You're seeing well, you know. What, so you, uh, for the people who don't know, for the listeners who are out there don't know, you did the first Bachata Festival ever. Yeah, yeah. So um, did, how did that come about? When did you, like, where did you get the inspiration? So uh, I mentioned to Juan that we should do 100% Bachata Pai. At that point, no one had done it yet, um, at least in Australia that we knew of. Mm -hmm. um, and what started off as a party, then people started asking about it. And so we said to the different schools, okay, if you want to come and be a part of it, that's fine, but you have to give us one budget the performance, uh -huh. um, and then you have to join. And so then every school, all of a sudden, that wanted to join what went from a single night party to a two, three day festival, the condition was they needed to teach at least one budget the routine. And we did that to try and get everybody teaching it. Got it. Um, but then as a result of that, when we started promoting it, people like Rod Chata, Rodney contacted us from the US and said, you guys are having a festival? Can I come out? We're like, yeah, sure, come out. And then we had people from New Zealand saying, hey, we heard you're doing this. We're like, yeah, come out. And then it just grew from there. What year was the first fest, or the not festival, before you, called, when you were just doing the parties? What year was that? About 2008. Okay. Look, my my memory at the moment <laughs> is not the best because... You're 25? I, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, because I'm on chemo. Okay. And so there's this thing called chemo brain Got where it. your memory kind of comes in and out. Okay. So for most part, I'll be 100% confident. The parts where I'm like, I'm not sure. Yeah. No but worries. yeah, definitely it was about, yeah, 2 8, I think. 2 okay. 8 was the first one. And then when did you decide to call it a festival around? What year was that? That first year. That, oh, that first year you're like, yeah. Oh, it's a festival. So what turned from a one, it was supposed to be a one night party. Turned out into a three-day event. Oh, so as you were communicating and later it just started growing. Yeah, and we decided, you know why, instead of making a one night, let's turn it into three nights and we'll call it a festival and see how it goes. So, the, you know, I, the detail of you requiring people to do a show yeah. is really interesting because I'm seeing a pattern now lately where it looks like the bachata dancers are moving away from doing shows. Yep. I don't know if you've observed the same trend or at least maybe not doing them but are a less emphasis on them. I don't know if you could share any insight on that. So it is, it is my opinion. I think the emphasis on shows is still there. Okay. But they're doing the shows in their class demos, not on stage. And so which one takes less work? Right. The demo in class. So they use that show to put on Instagram and get the hits instead of training and putting a choreography on stage. Yes. So are they doing performances? Yes, but different place. They're doing it at the workshop instead of doing it at night. That's excellent. Now, with that said, how do you think that impacts the social dancers who are watching these on YouTube yeah. or you know, Instagram and saying, and, and seeing that, do you think there's a positive, negative effect or, or just whatever? What do you think the repercussions of that are? In so I think there's two things, you know, uh, sex sells. That's the way it is. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you, if a person's watching and they've never done bachata before, but they get mesmerized by this sexy couple looking intimate, they're going to want to do it. Right. And so that brings them in. But then they don't understand that most of those people are actually couples. Right. And then when they try to do the same with other people, it doesn't work. And that leads to other problems. Yes. yes. That leads to other problems. Yeah, in our class, we usually say, hey, when two people are having sex, they let people touch themselves in places <laughs> they don't let other people. So unless you're yeah. not having sex with the person you're dancing with, yeah. don't touch them in all those places. 
Yeah, that that so you know, to me, I look at the performance demo now. Yep. As if if social dancers are thinking that that's how you social dance, I think some of these moves are really problematic for either beginners doing 100%. or I, you know in some cases i don't think any of those moves should be ever be done off of a stage right yep. like li yep. lifts i'm not a fan of lifting anybody in a crowded area where anything agree. could go wrong and now you can hurt someone yeah um, especially someone you haven't trained with or whatever yep. and and yeah the the i wish the demos you do them but make them Social. So this is an example of what we would look like social dancing at our yeah. best. And we're putting all, but these are still social moves that you can do with anyone who's at the level that you're at. Yeah. Now, the reason why I say the demos are more shows than actual demos mm -hmm. is because if you look at 90%, 90% of the videos now, mm -hmm. you can't tell what they actually taught. Mm -hmm. Where before, yeah. you used to demo what you taught in class so the student could take it away and practice. That's a good point. And then when we first started putting it on YouTube, so people could see what you're teaching. Yes. Now demos, 99% of the time, people are doing prepared shows or demonstrations. We might have them moved once, maybe twice, but then everything else that makes the people go, wow, has got nothing to do with what they taught in class. Yeah. Let's get it. Let's get it together, guys. <laughs> um, wow. In so, saying that, we are in a different world now, right? Yeah. We're in, you know, uh, instant gratification, likes and comments, and people get popular from that. Yeah. And if that's going to get them work, then I guess that's not a bad thing. Yeah. But somehow, the translation between what they're doing and what happens on the social dance floor. Yeah has to come across in a better way. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's just put a little more effort into it. You can, yeah. you can do these performance demos with a little bit higher production outside somewhere really nice yeah. and show what you actually taught in the class. Or, you know, what um, I try to do in my workshops with my partner is we do what we demoed in the class, we demonstrate yeah. it in both directions and then we go into the social dance part yep. so it's clear that we just repeated this thing yeah, twice, that's what we do. Yeah. and now you know okay they taught that and now they're showing us what a social but we stick to whatever we do in those uh demonstrations has to be leadable has to yep. be social nothing that is you know show yep. only now that makes sense that makes sense um so in the bachata scene so, um, but, sorry, before we um, go off of that, I, I, what was the second festival? Sorry, I want to go back to So you guys did your your festival yeah. first, um, and that was 2009, you said? Or 2008. 2008, okay. 2009 and then, um, do you recall who did the second one? Look, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was Lithuania. Okay. Oh, wow. Lithuania. Was, it, was it Lithuania or Sweden? Mm -hmm. one, of the, one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, I forgot his name. Yeah, I'm not going to describe That's it. Right. We're we'll, on camera. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll look it up. Lithuania, Machata, 2009-10. Yeah. Or it could have been Sweden. Sweden, wow. Um, uh, do you remember what year Tony started doing the Sexy Latin Fest? I think it would have been the following year. The following year, okay. Yeah. And then, and then I think Rodney and Lee did their Reno thing right around. Yeah, so Ronnie right. then did, uh, he, he wanted to test it out. They told him, no, maybe you should do some workshops first. He said, no, no, I want to try it anyway. But instead of doing it in San Fran, which was the initial goal, he did it in Reno. Got it. And that worked and then continued. Oh, he originally it. wanted to do it in San Fran. Yeah. Uh, That's cool. Yeah. I actually learned that this week. The weekend just went past. Okay. Okay. Yeah. What, so you were at Ronnie's event this, this yeah. weekend? Very yeah. Wow. Okay. Yes, that's why we wanted to talk to you because you were just <laughs> this wealth of knowledge. You got this encyclopedia of bachata. I do want to really quick go back to these people telling you that you can't do what you know, the lamba zook and the stuff that you were doing. If you don't mind me asking, what ethnicity were they? Were they Europeans? Were they Latinos? So there was. I mean, it was mainly YouTube trolls. And if you go to some of my older videos, you'll you'll see okay. it. You know, I would say main, mainly Latinos. Okay. 
there was this one guy who was infamous for trolling. His name was Carlos from New York. Well, I'm guessing you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I got a good Carlos story. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I mean, him at that point, whether it was me, whether it was Juan Ruiz, or like he would just go to town on us. I, re I remember. He was yeah. prolific on trolling. So at first, you know, we used to try to engage him. Yeah. And then we were at a the New York Inter uh, International Salsa Congress. Yep. And it was, I think, our second year when we introduced the bachata room there. And we were at the pre-party. And this gentleman comes up to me. And he, and he looked kind of familiar, but I, and he introduced himself as Carlos. And I was like, wait, are you Carlos? <laughs> He's like, yeah. And I was like, dude, what is your problem? He's like, no, man. Listen, I just do that for, you know, that's my persona online. You know, I love you guys. You know, everything's great. You know, it's yeah. just, I'm just trolling or whatever. He didn't use that word. Yeah. But he was super nice. And I was like, oh, wow. okay, cool. Well, you know, dude, yeah. don't do that. Like, you know, these are real people you're affecting. And, yeah. you know, it comes across as you're really trying to, you know, do this. He's yeah. like, oh, don't worry. I'm, I'm I love you guys. I'm sorry. Yeah. The next day, he starts leaving. Oh, the oh. Like, and that's when I said block. And I, you know, I just told all my friends. I said, "Don't feed the trolls." Yeah. Because the, you know, when when you keep giving them the tickets, everybody's talking and making them more and more famous. They're, that's what they want, right? So I said, if you just block this person and everyone blocks them, they don't travel in a while. You instantly take away all their power. Yeah. And so that's always been my theory ever since that because yep. one, I never had to hear from him again. I never saw him in any of my comments. Yeah. So don't feed the trolls. Yeah. But yeah, that guy was really, there was a, a couple of other guys, I can't remember the name, but they were really going hard. Um, you know, so we're working with a project in the Dominican Republic called Ade Ene Bachata, yep. where for the first time the Dominican government and um, the, inst the business institutions are getting together to use bachata to promote the island and tourism wow. and yeah. products. You know, it's an amazing time to be alive. This, this is such an important thing for the culture. And, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to communicate to, especially the, the more traditionalist uh, teachers, people who like, or even the trolls, yeah. is when you say to someone, don't do that, or you can't do that, or that's not real bachata, you're actually discouraging them from visiting the Dominican Republic when you're yeah. saying it under the name of, this is how Dominicans feel. Yeah. Because if I dance zucchata, modern, or whatever, and I'm told that the Dominicans don't like it, why would I want to go there and yeah. be ridiculed or whatever? And I don't think they realize they're actually being... Against, they're working against the culture and the current um, yeah. desires of the Dominican government. Yeah. And it's just not the experience locally, you know. So my partner Bianca and I have been living there for over two years and we live in the capital and it's really diverse. Yeah. And we got there and saw people doing Zook moves when we got there. Yeah. Right. And, you know, they have YouTube and there's Dominicans who like it and there's Dominicans who don't like it. Yep. it you know, it's not a monolith, but, you know, I, I'm sure if you would have had an opportunity to, you know, go to the Dominican Republic, a lot of people would have seen you dancing. I'm like, that's amazing. I want to learn how to do that. Have you ever had the opportunity to, to, to go and dance? In Fortunately, the not yet. Okay. It is on my bucket list to do. Got it. All right. Um, All right. Well, right. I, I hope you get to, to do that for sure. Um, okay. So I got a, a couple of questions for you. All right. Um, first, favorite bachata dancer it could be couple you can give me a lead and follow yep any style you could break it up into styles however you want to do it but you know who are your favorite dancers um that's easy I have been for a long time okay. Jorge and Tanya. Uh, okay um the reason for that is they've you know uh, first of all i've known them i've i met tanya before uh, i even did bachata i met her when i was a salsa dancer okay that's right um but one of the things that I appreciate from their dancing and that I think is important is that what they do is not just for them two. So the way they dance is not just for two people who are in love. Mm, that's good. And so that's important. I run a school. I try to grow a bunch out there in Australia. And I want everybody to dance. That's, that's such so, an important distinction yeah, to make. We've had, we've had them to Sydney, in Sydney, to Sydney three times and one virtually. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I, I mean, I already believed in, but also with them kind of encouraged it more. Um, and it's something that I was told maybe not that long ago. Um, 
they said the difference between me and some other teachers, they said to me, you teach us how to dance, these teachers will teach you how to hold a woman. Mm. And I'm like, that's okay, because I'm going to teach you how to dance with my wife. Right. <laughs> you know? So, but I think it's because I'm not so much into that sensual stuff yeah. where other teachers are. And I get it. Everyone's on where they want to be. But for me, that's something that when I see Jorge and Tanya, um, one, I can relate to a lot of stuff they do. Um, and two, I think the way they dance is for everyone, not just for a couple that's together. That's so good because really at the end of the day, we want as many people to be a part of this and you shouldn't have to be in an intimate relationship with the person you're yeah. dancing with in order to have a good time. Yeah. Not only that, but obviously at a dance social when you're changing partners. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you dancing with everyone as if they're your wife or your lover, that's going to get really awkward really yeah. fast. That That's awesome. Okay. Favorite bachata musician? Oh. Or like group, you know, Romeo, yeah. whatever, whatever. No, that's easy. Um, Hector Acosta. Oh, oh, I really love his music. Okay. I've done heaps of choreography through his music. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to take him to Australia yet, but hopefully we'll be also at some point. That is awesome. Um, but for him, I guess he's my all-time favorite. Is, yeah. there, is there a, a specific, is there something specific about his style or, you know, that, that draws you to him? Because he's definitely really unique in terms of the, um, I call them like the classical bachateros, right? Yeah. Because he's there with like Zacarias, Frank Reyes, and all yep. those guys. But he's, he definitely stands out. Is there yeah. So look, I, I, I love all types of bachata, mm -hmm. you know. But one thing that I like about him is, uh, being Latino, I still love the very traditional sound. Yeah. I love hearing all the instruments. I love hearing, understanding the lyrics, understanding the story, you know, so I can connect not just with what I'm hearing, you know, uh, musically, but also with what is being said you know, through the vocals. Right. Um, and I really enjoy his music for that. That, you know, that, that's such a good point too in terms of, you know, so many of the listeners don't speak Spanish. Yep. And so they don't understand exactly what the song is about. And, you know, to me, that plays such a huge role in the way you might interpret yep. the, the way you're dancing, the mood, the, the, yep. the chemistry. I don't know if you've heard about it. I did a bachata for Gringo series just for that, where I interpret, you know, the cool. translate the stuff yeah. to people because I'm dancing with somebody and it's like, I hate you. And I don't know, and they're like, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the yeah. time when I said, Look, I'm having a good time too, but I'm have, uh, this song is also triggering me right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I need a moment <laughs> to, to, to gather my thoughts. Yeah. All right. All right. So do you have a favorite song? Not necessarily from Torito. Maybe your favorite song might be from another artist. Um, oh, Esta Vida, Esta I think vida. it's Oscar Okay, yeah. Um, love that song. Nice, okay. Yeah. Well, Oscar, man, rest in peace, Oscar. Let me check our time. Oh, we're doing great outside. Um, man, Oscar, he's so good. We, we, um, we had a, him at a concert in a festival called Pachatu that we did in the Dominican yep. Republic, and he came out and said, listen, I know I'm not the best bachatero. I'm, I can't fill a room like Anthony Santos and Chirur, and I can't do this like El Torito, but I can do something that no other bachatero can do. I can sing like a woman. And he proceeded to do an Ana Gabriel song and it just floored everyone. Wow. And then Zeke Rubalcaba, who's Mexican, was there and he was like, That's Amazing. And then Yoscar brought him on stage and they just had this whole moment wow. together. Ah, Yoscar was, we lost a gem when, when we lost him. He was, he was amazing. All right. Um, well, speaking of love and dance and your wife, so you, how long have you and Rebecca been uh, dancing together? I, I, I think I saw you guys competing in 2014 or something like that. Yeah. So we've been I've been competing with my wife, okay. depending on the situation. Got it. So okay. me and Rebecca normally don't dance together. I have another dance partner called Katrina. Um, and because Rebecca doesn't like to compete. Got it. When Katrina got pregnant, I was competing with a lady named Kylie. But Rebecca's always danced in my teams. And so both Katrina and Kylie got pregnant um, <laughs> at different times. So then whenever I'd travel or compete, I'd compete with Rebecca. Oh, okay. Um, we love dancing together. 
Um, but competition brings extra pressures. And then it goes from the dance floor to the house. So therefore, we, to reduce that, um, we normally don't compete together. But uh, last year we did. Um, we did uh, compete in Miami. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, um, and that was special for us because for different reasons, and we're doing it for different reasons, more because of my illness. Um, we didn't know whether it would be the, you know, the last time I'd be able to compete. Um, it doesn't have to be because of something tragic, but maybe just because of treatment. I can't. So now we spend more time dancing together because it's about the time that we've got, not necessarily about the result. Of course. So we travel more together, we compete more together. and. So what, um, you know, what advice would you give to couples? Because how, how long have you guys been together now? About eight years. About eight years. Yeah, eight. married five. You know, staying together in this type of lifestyle, do you have any tips or, you know? Yeah, look, if you would have asked me three years ago, my response would have been different okay. to now. And I think my response now is after my diagnosis, I realized that all the fights we used to have, not important. And so therefore, dancing together with your partner, you know, there shouldn't be any fights. And if there is, you gotta try and let go straight away. Because ultimately, if you're dancing with someone you love, that's what it should be about. Mm. So if you put any more pressure than that, then that's when things don't work. That's good. Um, um, definitely wanna get to that in a little bit. I, I did wanna ask you about uh, your perspective on, on competitions and kind of what what you see their role is in the dance scene. Yep. You know, some people are like, "Well, why compete?" Or you know, what, what do you what do you what value do you see in competitions, and and how do you see that you know they can help or hurt or yep. know, different. Australia, it's a sporting nation, so we focus so much on sport. People love it. If we didn't have competitions then maybe people would not be so immersed in the dance because it's not cultural. So through the school, we teach people to dance, but those who stay longer are the ones that get into performance and competition. And so that gives them something to focus on. And then from that, they get better and they become better social dancers as well. So for a country that is so far away from Latin America, it's the way to make people better because even though social dancing is, is really big, hasn't always been like that. Um, and it's hard to tell an Australian who, one, you grow up, dancing's not for men. Um, two, don't understand the music, don't understand the culture. To tell them, hey, this is normal dance with someone versus let's train for this, they're always going to go down the let's train part. That makes sense. Yeah. That's good. So kind of using competition one as a marketing tool to get people interested and then also to train people to become better. Yeah, so the, the performance it. side, which then leads to competition. That's good. It helps people push and work towards something higher. And that's how they get better. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so with that, let's talk a little bit about Unstoppable and, <laughs> you know, your condition that you, you made yeah. reference to. Maybe our, you know, our listeners don't know. Okay, uh, so in 2000, uh, just when COVID started, I was diagnosed with uh, stage four bowel cancer. Um, it was really late, so it's um, deemed terminal, and I was given until June last year. Um, but I'm still here, and I'm here for a long time. Um, but one of the things that, and interestingly enough, uh, I feel that I'm still here is because of dance, because it gives me something to look forward to every day. Um, I think I'm very privileged and blessed to have this as a job. I see it as my job is to make people happy. And with the school, there's a lot of people there. So every day I get to come in and do that. Um, going through chemotherapy, which is why well, I've got this on, my hair's falling out. Um, also, you know, you get rashes in the face. I have like six operations. I've been chopped up left, right and center. But every time I go into something, I always remember, okay, I've got this event coming up. I've got I to gotta get better for that. I, I, I got to recover for that. I can't stop because of this. So it always gives me something to plan forward to. And because my wife is always there and she's always, you know, we got to be ready for this. And, you know, she has the same mindset with me, which is always just look forward. Um, and that's where the song Unstoppable comes from. Um, I actually wrote a song for her. Um, 
as, as a present. And then I thought, why not give it to someone and see what they think? So I sent it off to Derek Della. Um, and he read it and he liked it. And he said to me, oh, you know, I spoke to Vinny and would like to produce it. I'm like, oh, wow. I, I thought it would never get to that point. Um, the, the original lyrics were a little bit more personal, intimate. So uh, with Vinny and Derek, we adjusted a little bit so it could be more for everyone, more relatable for everyone. Um, but that's, that's the purpose of the song. It was for my wife. And because of what we're going through, it's, we just keep going. We just keep going. That's beautiful. Yeah. Bachata as a, a reason to live, an energy and yeah. love and, you know, bachata as a music and through lyrics and dance, you know, you can share life with someone that you love and inspire others. I mean, hearing that song and, and you know, the lyrics and, you know, it's extremely touching and, you know, obviously, yeah. thank you for sharing that with us. And, and you've, you know, you've been very public with, um, sharing your journey with with the community and i think that's that's been a blessing because as you mentioned earlier we take so many things for granted and, and re yeah. relationships and you know you didn't have to do that you could have kept it private and you, yeah. you know i'm sure it's got to be difficult um, to to share some of these intimate yeah. things with people that... look i think whether it's this or anything else when you wake up in the morning and you've been told you know this is how much time you've got left mm -hmm. It changes everything. It changes everything. Um, changes the way you think. It changes, you know, what you do. And a lot of people in my situation, understandably so, tend to kind of stop and think, well, why do I continue? I've been told that that's the finish line and it's a lot closer than expected. So they kind of sit back and wait. Yeah. Um, I did the opposite. Uh, I, I think cancer is a race and it's trying to catch up to me. So as soon as I stop, it'll catch up. So I just got to keep going, keep going. And until I stop, this won't catch me. So that's where dancing comes in. And, you know, um, why did I go public? Because if I knew what I know now before, I probably could have prevented this. You know, I was misdiagnosed for like three years and that's why it got so late. Um, but you know, even just a minor symptom, which might mean nothing to somebody could be something, you know? So I hopefully if one person gets to avoid my situation because I shared it, um, then it's worth it. hundred uh, percent. Absolutely. Thank you for doing that. I, I couldn't agree more. You're inspiring and you're encouraging people to focus on the things that matter. Yeah. All right. So I got a couple of things uh, to wrap us up, um, which are kind of what you've already you've already started kind of addressing it. But I kind of wanted to see if you can give some tips, some pro tips to organizers since you've already. Yeah. How, how many years now have you been doing Sydney? It'll be 16 years. 16 years. So what what tips do you have for people who are organizing festivals or who want to start a festival? You know, I think when people first start festivals, they think. I'm going to get the most popular um, and then I'm going to sell the most tickets. 16, 17 years on. The people who have the most impact are the ones they are going to dance with everyone. Mm -hmm. You can have an amazing show, but if that doesn't translate to the way that you treat people socially, these people are not going to want you back. Mm -hmm. um, you can have a plain show. But if the people who are paying to be there get to dance with you, get to talk to you, enjoy your workshops, they're more prone to come back and want you there over the amazing shows that have no interaction. Um, and that's how we try to choose our artists. Um, for the last few years, you know, we always look for up and coming artists because we know they're going to put that extra effort in to dance with everybody. Um, and you know, in Australia, we're so far away from everyone. I'm guessing like if, if you're in Europe or even here in the US where you're saturated with amazing dancers, maybe that's not as important, but from where we are, 100%. It's good. Yeah. All right, what advice would you give to a beginner dancer? 
don't give up. Um, be okay with getting a no, because that's part of the journey. Whether it's, uh, no, I don't want to dance with you. Whether it's, no, I can't dance with you. Whether it's, uh, no, you can't go up to this level. No, you're not ready to perform in this team. That's all part of the journey. And if you can't handle a no, then everything gets too hard. Because I think a no is not necessarily you're not good enough. It's just you're not ready yet. Or if you're social dancing, it just means that person's not ready yet. Which is okay because sometimes somebody asks you and you're not ready yet. So understanding that no is not a negative um, and knowing how to use it to push forward. That's good. Yeah. And lastly, what advice would you give to a pro dancer? Lives Don't forget this. where you came from. Mm. Don't forget that once you were that beginner on the edge of the dance floor, wanting to dance with the artists that are there. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, so I want to end with two things. Yeah. First, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, Brian. Time is the most valuable thing that we have yeah. in, in this world. So, our you know the, our listeners. You know, you've dropped so many gems and, and this is going to help so many people. So thank you for doing that. I wanted to share two things with you. The first one is um, tomorrow, because uh, we're here at the uh, Maui Salsa and Bachata Festival. Uh, Ataka na Alemana uh, would like to dedicate their uh, demonstration or they're going to do a social dance, not a yeah. performance. <laughs> But they're going to use Unstoppable, and they want oh, to dedicate wow. that to you. So I just want you to know ahead of time so that you'll be there for that. Yes. Um, I think it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. And then the second thing is, if you are available, um, November 16th through the 20th is the ADN Bachata World Festival, which is the festival that we have in the Dominican Republic. Yeah. It's the first one that the government and the businesses have been involved in. And we would like to invite you to come and experience our culture and say thank you in person for being that pioneer and being that first person to be willing to take all the financial risks, all the emotional risks yeah. uh, for starting the first Bachata Festival and this beautiful community that we've started. So if you're available, we want you to come. And I didn't know you'd never been there. And now, now you yeah. can check off one of those Look, things. That, 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 sound, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, that sounds amazing. So we'll, we'll check your calendar. Yeah. If you're yeah. available, we would love to have you. Okay. So, Asha, thank you so much. We appreciate thank you. you. Keep doing what you're doing and keep being unstoppable. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. To support the Bachata Popiwa podcast, make sure you bachata the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell so that we can let you know whenever there's new episodes. To support the Bachata Popiwa podcast, please check out the sponsor links below. Bachata Popiwa.